afternoon, everyone uh, uh, joining us now from all over the world. It is maybe good afternoon in the UK and most Europeans, but maybe good evening in many parts of Africa and I believe in the Middle East. And I think in Asian countries is almost very late or maybe the early morning of ours, but wherever you are is a very uh, warm welcome to all of you. And thank you very much for joining us in this uh, short, but very, uh, if you like, very uh, rich a conversation we're going to have with Professor Farida Fortune. Today, we are celebrating uh, a very important day for the United Nations calendar and many people across the world, not just in academia, but across the world, people are celebrating this day, which is International Day for Women and Girls in Science. And this day is being celebrated across the world, not just uh, for equal opportunity and empowerment of women, but also uh, as the United Nations has put it, is how women are become an agent of change. Women are now changing societies, changing government, the way we do things, and particularly women in science and technology. This year, the World Association for Sustainable Development, as usually we celebrate this day every year. Last year, we celebrated it uh, with two young scientists, one of them from South Africa and one from uh, was in um, the Sorbonne University. Uh, and uh, with the UNESCO chair on, on women in science and technology, we have a partnership with the chair. Uh, this year, we rather uh, excited to celebrate this day with the, the, the journey of Professor Farida Fortune, not just in science and technology or not just in medicine or not just in dentistry, but Farida, uh, if I say that she's a true global example of academic, uh, a woman, of an educator, of a policymaker, of someone who is really bridging across all, if you like, territories. Uh, I know if I start reading to you, most of you know her, but I think we have already circulated uh, a flyer about her achievement in medicine or in this history. But uh, I think I will share it with you just maybe for a few minutes for those who are following us from all over the world. Uh, Professor Frida Fortune has done a, re a lot of work in, for the surface of the science itself, the medicine, the dentistry, uh, the medical profession, the community, uh, for the United Kingdom, for the university, for Queen Mary University, and in the World Association for Sustainable Development. We are very proud and very pleased for all the engagement we had with Professor Frida Fortune. I will read them very quickly. I know I, the list is very long, but it's just for our viewers who are watching us from all over the world. She's a professor of medicine in relation to oral health since 2002 at Queen Mary University of London. She's the director of Center for Immunobiology and Regenerative Medicine, director of London, uh, Bessett Center of Excellence, senior policy fellow at Queen Mary, University Policy Institute, I think it's Global Policy Institute. She graduated in both dentistry and medicine from University College, University of London, and she obtained her PhD from the United Medical Schools of Guys and St. Thomas University in London in 1992. She is speci specialist registrar in oral medicine before in dentistry and immuno, uh, immunology medicine. I think our list of honors and awards are very impressive, but they're very long. We selected some of them. Uh, and I think when we selected them, we tried to show her connection with the community, with service to the country, to her university, and human being in general. Recognition, she's been recognized by the president of the British Society of Oral Medicine in 2007, and the president of uh, Odontology Section of the Royal Society of Medicine in 2011. She was uh, included and selected in the list of the top five most influential Muslim women in the, in the United Kingdom in the Guardian Society segment. She was elected uh, a fellow of the Royal College of Physicians in 2007. She received the prestigious Courier Gold Medal for significant contribution to the profession through their research, teaching and clinical work in 2012. She received the honor from the Queen CBE for service to dentistry, which is one of the highest le level normally given in the United Kingdom by the Royal Family for people for service to this country, to the United Kingdom. 
She's a honorary fellow of the Royal College of uh, Sergion, highest honor by the college award. Slagva, uh, I think the list will really go on and on. Slag medal participatory, uh, particularly outstanding contribution to the college and its successors. Senior lecturer in immunology and honorary consultant in oral medicine. Dean and director of the Institute of Dentistry at Queen Mary University. Clinical director for uh, dentistry, head of neck, including uh, maxillofacial surgery, an ENT, fellow Royal College of uh, Physician, Royal College of Physician, and the Royal College of Surgeons. The list is really long. And I'm not here to embarrass you, uh, Professor Farida, but your achievements have been really remarkable and noticeable across the whole valley. But I'm just going to talk about two things very quickly or very briefly which I hear them from people across London. And uh, I know across the world we hear them. We're going to hear from some of the people you have worked with them and you have left a significant impact on the way they appreciate your collaboration. We're going to hear from them directly. I wouldn't really spoil that. But what I have heard from many people in London or across the community, you have also been significant in connecting universities and academia with the local community, particularly in East London. You have done lots of work with community in East London. I'm sure you will touch on that. I wouldn't want to talk too much. Also, you have used your knowledge and expertise in terms of connecting people like uh, religious leaders during the COVID-19 in terms of conveying message to some community groups where they needed to listen to this message from their, uh, if you like, spiritual leader, like I remember, the work you have done in uh, your university, Sheikh Babikir and other and others, uh, your students always talk quite high about you. You have tremendous number of graduates. So I can talk for a long time, Farid, but I'm going to stop here because I think people are here really wanted to listen to you. Uh, the one final word I want to say from all the people I have spoken to, they have met you in the World Association for Sustainable Development. They talk about something different which is very nice when you're an academic to hear this. They, some of them, they mention you are a very nice person. Oh, Alam, the conference, we would love the conference, which you have co-convened with me in, uh, was supposed to be hosted by Queen Mary. Oh, we were looking forward to come to London, so we will meet Professor Farida. So the human side of you, Farida, has been significant. And I think all of us academic, we would love to be, if you like, excited of being good friends, uh, nice people, kind. This is a word normally with academics, I think are more important than our publication other. So you have all this. I think I will stop here and the, Farida, the floor is yours. I think the format of today, we will give Professor Farida for sure to give us her talk. And then after that, we have some of Farida's colleagues across the world, if they want to say a few words, we will give them that opportunity. And then we will try to finish all this in one hour. Anyone would like maybe to ask or to get, uh, if you like, uh, not just necessarily a question, but if you would like to make any comments or anything, particularly from anyone here, you are very welcome. And uh, Frida, the floor is yours. It's a great honor to have you, Frida. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Professor Allen and uh, being part of the WASTI and uh, UNESCO agenda. Uh, I have to say it's a huge surprise. So I'm really humbled and thankful uh, to you for giving me this platform today. If we are ever going to change or tackle any of the health issues, as well as combating climate change, we have to engage and employ and empower all of the population. So why are we talking about women in science and girls in science today? It's because the global population of almost 8 million and half of them are billion rather, and half of them are women. Yet only 30% in Europe are in science, uh, in the Eastern European countries, it's higher, but is much less in other countries. However, 70% of women around the globe work in healthcare, in all forms of healthcare, 
But of those, only 28% are women as doctors, and an even smaller amount of them, 10%, sit in uh, the higher level of the administration of policymakers driving the agenda of either health and science today. Teaching science, so from my personal background, teaching science in Africa, in Asia, all of those countries, Malaysia, uh, Sri Lanka, India, China, is fantastic, and South America. I've been there, I've seen it, and I know it's very good. So why do we have so few people? Why aren't we harnessing that in an equitable manner? And there's some very obvious reasons. Um, I remember when I was a PhD student, uh, one of the supervisors said to me, women never do anything, you know. Yeah, I was doing all the donkey work, running experiments for four, uh, four or five days. Uh, have you ever heard of a woman who's famous in medicine? Have you ever heard of a woman who's famous in art? And before I could say anything, walked away. We don't. He was absolutely right. And we hear even less about the women who have contributed in science. And if you go carefully through the internet, there are almost 100 women, and we don't hear about it at all. And, you know, the women who did the maths for people going to the moon, uh, for NASA, um, the woman who discovered DNA, nobody knows their names. It goes on and on and on the list. And so that's uh, a problem. So they have made an impact on history, but actually we don't hear about them. And that allows less and less people to come into uh, the field. So firstly, I, we are invisible. But women are not seen, right? And I know that when you sit around the table, somebody says, oh, I'm sorry, uh, you, my blind spot. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't think you had an agenda here when you're simply wanting to contribute to the conversation. So, and the institutional sexism, okay, it's ongoing globally. It's everywhere. It's in the NHS. Uh, it's in, so, so that's healthcare. It's in the universities. It's in the workplace. People constantly trying to, uh, get women into high positions, but actually when it's so embedded, you're not going to uh, get anywhere. And women actually can contribute and we see they do contribute a lot, but nobody hears about them. So especially in the marginalized communities, uh, you don't hear about them, you don't see about them. So when I go to a local school and this fantastic, young girl of 15 is there, you know, doing very well. And I'd say, so what are you going to do, you know, when you finish? Oh, she says, I'm going to go and work in the local supermarket. Um, and so they don't aspire because they can't see anything around them, which uh, enables them to uh, think out of the box. As I say, they lack accessibility. They don't get the chance I mean, I, I know, uh, again, personally, that people are in special groups, they're invited away over the weekend, they're given leadership training. Well, how many of them are women? How many of them are from marginalized groups? How many of them actually uh, don't look like uh, 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 different people to have all sorts of disabilities? You just don't get the women there. So very, very marginalized uh, population. And I said that, you know what, they are role models, but they're not visible either. And so we have a duty and a right to do that. Um, so I think you have to use the UN's uh, human right, rights approach. And that is equity, fairness, and justice, right? And so, for equity, it's fairness and justice, diversity, 
around the cultural give, ethnic and religion, uh, it is uh, hugely, hugely. And inclusiveness. Now, the inclusiveness is the bit that gets left out all the time, although people talk about it all the time, people aren't included in group. Can I kindly ask you to all switch off your... Uh... Sorry for it, I think... Uh, okay. Sorry about this. Don't worry. Uh, don't worry. <laughs> it's actually someone I know. So... Um, <laughs> So uh, as I said, is use a human rights approach of equity, diversity, and inclusion. But within the subheadings within all of those, which are not taken any notice of, and they were so concerned at the UN that in 2011, there was an agenda for change. And that's when they decided the STEM subjects, so that science and technology was really, really important. And I can remember going around Africa, going to Ethiopia, going to quite a few countries where they were trying to embed this. But what was happening is they were setting up these institutes. And then when you next went, the institutes mainly had men in them. Um, so that's that not it's really... Okay, and not really. Okay, uh, so the STEM subjects, when I went back again, what had happened is uh, it was full of men. So there's a strap line. I signs, we signs, she signs to innovate and to lead, all right? And I think this is really, really important. I know there's a whole load of strap lines, but these are really important because it could and should actually garner people around this. So how do we, and people like you and me, make a difference? You have to work with like-minded people, and I always try to do that. You always have to think and be able to share, take criticism and cooperate together and share sustainable solutions. And we've done that with one of the big projects where we have satellite connections which go across Africa so they can actually access uh, uh, teaching and much more uh, educational material. So I won't uh, uh, share uh, uh, lots more of that, but I think working with people and with uh, the UN and UNESCO and WASD and um, also the huge diaspora groups is important. And it's really important to not only tell people what to do, but ask people because usually local people and people in their own country know much more than you do. You only act as a, a facilitator. So how did I get here, right? Uh, I, I said once to you that uh, when I was invited to the United Nations and about to give a talk, I spent most of the time sitting in the group in my room and trying to make sense of how someone like me had got to this point uh, uh, after quite a long journey, but something I, I never ever thought would happen. So firstly, I had, uh, I was born into a fantastic family, all right? And I think uh, that's good. And our family is huge all over the world. And we all still really maintain our links very well. Um, I had a grandmother born in 1871, who was absolutely amazing in apartheid South Africa, you know, in the Boer War. And she got to be one of the matrons in the field. Uh, she got to helping high people in the siege of Kimberley. She started the first uh, women's uh, workers group 
um, in a very, very difficult environment. So this is in the uh, early 1900s and such a powerful influence that all of us, all of us, our children, our great grandchildren uh, know about her and remember. And then I had a, a fantastic mother who came from an entirely different uh, cohort and her thing was discipline, okay? And if you have discipline and work hard, uh, you can achieve anything. And my dad, all my father wanted was education, education, education for all his children. And he worked to make that happen. He was a brilliant mind and did not have the ability uh, 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 to do that. And he made sure that we did. So from this wonderful family, um, you know, I got sent here and years later I said to him, you know, what's this thing about girls getting educated? And he said, you know what, if you educate a girl, you change your family, your community and the world. If you educate a man in the world as we know today, it will change your family. He said, and so that was really, really important for me. So you can imagine uh, coming to a country which is cold and dark. I just wanted to sleep. I was freezing cold all the time at boarding school, the most terrible food you could imagine, uh, uh, and cold. However, I was living a dream, right? And that dream was I was going to make it happen. It was actually quite difficult because, again, you know, somebody uh, uh, doesn't look like you. Uh, why do they want to be taught? You know what? They don't need teaching. They can go and do a typing course. Um, and I, I fought really, really hard. I uh, managed to get my school changed. And I managed to get my O levels. That's a sort of like my trick. And then when I went to A levels, well, <laughs> no teaching at all. And so I was doing the sciences and I only went in for the experiment. They so didn't want you there that they didn't matter if you didn't come in. Once I got my uh, exams, nobody taught me about having interviews. I went off, interviewed for university and was told, uh, uh, dear madam, uh, we don't take people like you here, yeah, right? And go to that place in Gower Street, which I went. I knocked on every single door. It was in the middle of the ho uh, holidays until a man said, hello, who are you? What do you want? And there began my journey again with another woman. Says, gal, you pull them hair back. Damn white men, they want, don't want you unless you show your work hard, right? Uh, at pull your sleeves up when you go. I went for the interview and actually they took me. And I have to say at University College, I was looked after really, really well. It was the first time in London that I came across a diverse community of students and everyone was keen to make sure that we... Uh, uh, had a good education. I stayed there for dentistry and medicine and tried to go back to South Africa and nobody would employ me, but that was in the middle of the 80s. And my uh, uh, one of my sisters is at university and all the universities was closed and they really didn't want someone uh, like me there. And I came on and embarked on uh, 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 a career initially in the NHS. I was working and would have become a cardiologist in general and general medicine. When my old uh, dean uh, rang me and said, I don't think you should be doing this. You should be going to do your PhD. So I went ahead and did my PhD, which was very, very difficult. And I then started seeing the community that I would be working in. It was not equitable at that time. And if I was going to do anything, I was going to bow my head and work hard. Whatever people said, did, 
disregarded. Um, it was a, a very, 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 very difficult few years, which I sometimes find extremely difficult to discuss. I mean, I, I used to go in on Friday morning and be doing experiments till Tuesday afternoon, not having gone home, uh, expected to be there all the time. And I liked working, don't get me wrong, but I didn't like uh, the, uh, the management that came uh, around that. Anyway, I struggled because I knew that once I had my PhD, I would be in a different position. I was humiliated and humiliated, but I got there, I was in a different position, and I started, I had my own lab. And from there on, I built up my science part of my career, always keeping in mind there were other people like me who were in extremely difficult positions. And I think every scientist out there, whether you're man or woman, right, remember there's somebody behind your back who is having an extremely difficult time through all the uh, uh, reasons the United uh, Nations said for equity, uh, no diversity, and uh, inclusion. So do do that. It was very, very hard. And then I needed also not only to work in the universities, I needed to work in the Royal Colleges because the Royal Colleges set the standard. And that standard had to be equitable. So I, when I first joined, nobody only asked me to uh, apply uh, because they needed to show there were women. All right, don't worry, you won't get in. We just need to show that women have applied. Uh, unfortunately for them, I uh, there were 18 uh, applicants and I was top of the list, so they had to have me. And the first time I went, all the men stood and looked at their shoes. Nobody would look at me at all. And someone sidled up and said, oh, we don't have any jobs for you. I said, that's fine, I'm busy stayed there, okay, worked, became head of uh, examinations, and that took me all over the world. And I made sure that there was standard in the examination that was equitable for everyone, as well as all of the students and professionals coming from abroad uh, uh, to do that. So that was uh, another part and not at the same time, I was still continuing to run uh, my lab, and I've got a center of excellence for uh, rare diseases, which I thoroughly enjoy, and I have loads of PhD students and staff um, uh, uh, doing that. So one is on the thing, and then I became a head of school. Now, a head of school was a real a challenge, a huge honor at QM, because at that time, I was the only sort of uh, ethnic minority really in higher education sitting at the top table in the UK. Uh, a, a huge challenge. Uh, we had a fantastic uh, warden, uh, Nick Wright, uh, who uh, at least uh, uh, thought I could work hard. <laughs> and I, um, I managed through that. But I also did a very important thing. I looked around and saw we in the poorest community, one of the poorest in the UK. In the area I work in, it's a top four poorest communities in the whole UK. And you could see none of the kids were going to university. No one in my school came from local uh, community. And I worked from doing a laddering and I made sure that we had local people applying for the jobs. That way you got women in and then they could see that their children might be able to do the same work. They came in on the administrative side and then now we have uh, uh, local people. I was really proud when we had our first uh, uh, Bangladeshi student who has done brilliantly well. And now in Tower Hamlets, uh, when I first got there, not only me, the university and, and uh, Queen Mary have been very good, 
a specialist school of medicine and dentistry in this. When I first got there, um, almost no one went to university. Now, 60% of our local children go to the Russell Group. So that's the top echelons of a university in the UK. And, and I'm always saying, you know, not me, but everyone's got to do that. But what we do now have to do is, is to get the girls there. And the girls aspiring, they can do the science. They just don't think that that's for them, all right? The men have got there. And so it's a, still a huge job uh, to say, you've got to do the sciences, you can do it. And you know what? Come in, uh, we'll get you into the lab. You can see what the lab looks like. And I work in that fantastic building behind me. What an inspiration. And the pod behind me is where we have uh, school children. That's supposed to be a neuron, <laughs> a part of a nerve cell. Uh, and so I think that local uh, engagement, as my father said, it's far, far more important than having the international reach. So if you go anywhere international, all right, you're going there to be in a system to tell people what to do. And I think people in Africa will start lifting up their head and know that they can do and know that they can do better. So if you start looking at all the IT hubs that uh, are being set up, they're brilliant. The one in Kenya can compete with everyone. We have loads of kids who do maths in South Africa and come and do IT uh, in London or go to America. So I think people just ha have to start thinking that they can do better, all right? And I have to say that uh, there's this inherent uh, thing of not being good enough. And I had that for years, and sometimes I still go into a meeting and have that sort of imposter syndrome feeling you don't have to, you know, you shouldn't be there, all right? You are work going walking in a field, in science, in education, in the NHS, where you the minority, all right? And you have to be a role model and you have to make a difference. Don't sit there and take all the applause, all right? bring people up uh, uh, behind your back. I don't think that happens enough. I think the, I don't hear you, I don't see you. Um, why do you want to have an opinion when you just join in the conversation? I think uh, only we, as women in science, uh, will be able to do that. And the other thing is we tend sort of to be quite retiring and not go out. So I think the thing of going to your local school, going into the local community, working with your local uh, um, homeless uh, group, those are the sort of things that are important. Uh, and those are the things that will ripple and make a difference everywhere. All right, set up things locally and they will blossom. And don't only think, I think the, my international uh, uh, give is really important, but I think what I should be doing internationally is acting like a facilitator as opposed to someone who goes there and tell people what to do. So you look at my family, uh, how we've changed, you know, the next generation all went to university, the girls, uh, not only the boys, uh, and uh, they've done exceedingly well. The other thing is in families, there are a lot of stories of previous times when people were treated really badly, especially in South Africa. Nobody talks about it. You've got to make those stories. I mean, you've all heard of Dulcie September, she was shot in Paris. You know, so this was kept a secret. None of us knew about it. And she was standing up and saying, apartheid isn't good enough, right? And uh, was shocked because she did say that. 
And then when you look back, you suddenly realize loads of other things happened where we didn't have um, insight to it. And so I think, again, people shouldn't forget their histories and always build on it. And don't forget the people who came before you because you don't have to go out there for role models. They are there already. So I'm not going to say anything more, but I was just going to say, if I move away, you can see the fantastic building behind me. If I do this, <laughs> and you can see the neuron where the school children come into and are taught. So I am extremely privileged. I'm extremely lucky. And I don't begin a day without saying thank you and have gratitude for the opportunities I've had and ask for the ability for me to try and teach, empower and encourage others. But I'm also quite keen, this is International Women in Science Day, but I, what we can't do is make ourselves so different that we leave the men behind because I think you need both groups so they can learn together and see each other's inner strength. And until you do that, there won't be equality of opportunity if people are educated separately, if people are given expectations separately. One will always think they're better than the other. If you then just do women, they will think they're better than men. But actually, if we are going to change the world in a place where our grandchildren can live safely, healthily, and with good climate, we just have to do that. I am really, really grateful and thankful for this journey I had. It has sometimes been tortuous and discordant. But the value has been innumerable. And all I have to say is someone like my father, who became totally dispossessed, it needn't to have happened. But having done so, he has made sure that we will make sure, and it's part of all of our uh, opportunity, all of us here today to always look and say, you know, what have my parents done for me? Do, do you see the sacrifices they've made? We never ever see that. So never forget to give gratitude and thanks for opportunities. Sometimes things aren't as good as you'd like them to be, but hey, you know, wherever you are, wherever you are, there's always somebody worse off and you always better off. So. Think of the glass half full rather than empty. And again, may I say, uh, Prof. Adam, I'm hugely, hugely privileged and thankful for this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Farida. I think that was a, a wonderful uh, coverage of a, a very unique and inspirational uh, journey. Uh, I'm going to give uh, opportunities for some uh, of, I think we got like 20 minutes, which is very good. Uh, 20, uh, we're going to give opportunity to some of your colleagues and friends across the world who have worked with you to reflect, and also in the UK, of course. But before I do that, I'm just going to share with you, uh, you, you can find this in the flyer already circulated, but just for you, of, uh, I encourage you to go to the World Association for Sustainable Development YouTube channel. We've got huge videos there. But just to give you a, a, a few of the, I think we selected 12 videos, just to show you the contribution Professor Fareed has made to this massive, uh, if you like, uh, forum focusing on the sustainable development goals of the United Nations. For example, the first one on the left here, Farida was talking about online in, in our jointly organized conference with the United Nations on online learning, global health perspective and opportunities for the developing countries. This is when the United Nations, Dr. Petru Dimitriou, launched their e-learning pla platform report. The second one on the right, when Professor Farida was talking about 
current status of COVID-19 and vaccination in the UK. This was a hugely successful conference across the whole world. All these are international events. If you look here, she was also, this is interesting. She was talking in one of our round called Global Mind Debate, the African continent challenges in dealing with COVID. She was joined by leading professors from Cameroon and, and, and Morocco. Next to it, you can see also what I mentioned earlier, Professor Frida was heavily involved in also locally here in the UK or nationally, trying to help communities by using advocates from the leaders in the communities. This is coronavirus community perspectives on illness, uh, cleaning and protection. In that one, she was joined by a leading uh, Muslims uh, leader here, Sheikh Babikir from uh, Brent Cross uh, Mosque. Uh, this is another one also belonged to the United Nations. A round table was held at the University of East London where Professor Frida was also engaged in a, a round table discussion about women empowerment and human rights. So really you have a fantastic portfolio Farida of contributing to humankind really. Again, Professor Farida was uh, well received when she also contributed to a, a big uh, debate we had across the world with I think around 13 people from Canada, America, United Arab Emirates, uh, UK, uh, France and so on. That was, you remember the Black Lives Matter campaign she also contributed with Dr. Uh, Suhair Hamad Anil from UCL, Health Perspective Black Lives Matter. Recently in our uh, conference on the role of univer making universities work for the United or Sustainable Development Goal. This is one of her talk about COVID-19 pandemic, the knowledge environment and con uh, concluding remarks we made. He also moderated sessions like this one, which was very interesting where the speaker was from Kuwait about education for sustainable development, SDGs mapping. She delivered two uh, keynote talks to our conference with the United Nations International Maritime Organization in London. One of them we are featuring here, delivering health and education advocacy locally and internationally. The one on the bottom, uh, she also was, uh, she gave a very, uh, if you like a very strong talk to our, one of our major conference last year, higher education, leadership and future strategies in the Middle East and North Africa, that she was joined by the Minister of Higher Education from Sudan, lots of vice chancellors, uh, people across uh, the world. And on the bottom one on the right hand side, Professor Farida kindly hosted uh, a consultation and ideas uh, discussion group for a large Sudanese diaspora a uh, group in Queen Mary Universities where we had the Minister of Higher Education and Scientific Research, Professor uh, Tissar, and also the Minister of Education visiting the United Kingdom uh, for the, in, in the UK uh, major conference for education. So I think the portfolio for either you have done away from dentistry and medicine is remarkable, really. All these ones, I'm not saying they are out of dentistry, but your engagement, I think, uh, I don't know how people are, are nominated for the Nobel Prize, but I think you should, be, you, I think, I don't know, I have never been into that platform, but I think we should all nominate you for a Nobel Prize because I think Farida, for human beings, you have done a lot, a lot of work. You are a true academic with great impact on people's lives. So I'm going to start giving the first opportunity to one of your uh, colleagues, collaborator, and uh, a leading. Uh, if you can unmute yourself, Professor uh, Gonka. Professor Goncha Momko, she's the head of Health Informatics and Technologies, Faculty of Health Sciences, Marmara University in Turkey. And I will give other people also the opportunity. Just show me the hand I will give you. So Professor Gonka, go ahead. It is, uh, uh, I'm sure you want to say a few words here, go ahead. Thank you so much. Um, I met her uh, almost 20 years ago. Um, she's a brilliant scientist with high academic performance, and her goal is to do the best. Uh, when I was in London, uh, under her supervision in her clinic, uh, I learned a lot of things as a dentist, and I impressed so much uh, her positive attitude to uh, her colleagues and her patients and students. And she is polite, friendly, and positive 
uh, to people and to colleagues and patients always. I feel lucky to meet her and work together. Uh, I have to say that she's my hero and she's my mentor. I'm very happy to be here and congratulations, Farida. Thank you, my Concha. Okay, thank you very much, Professor. Thank you for having we also got people who commented on Professor Farida on our brochure. I'm, I'm not sure if Professor uh, Midion uh, Mafombo Kizonga from Zimbabwe. Professor, are you able to join us? I see I saw your professor. If you can unmute. Unmute, yes, I can, yeah. yes. So let me introduce you, Professor. Professor Kizonga is a professor of oral and maxillofacial surgery, Faculty of Medicine and Health Sciences, University of Zimbabwe. So uh, the floor is yours, Professor. Go ahead. Thank you very much. Peter, I've got mixed up. My what my my Zoom is playing up now. Okay. <laughs> okay. What am I supposed to be doing? Okay, I'm trying to get back. Yes. Uh, yes, I've known. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, Professor. Yeah. I have known uh, Rashida for more than what, 20 years, and she has been extremely helpful, apart from being my mentor, in terms of hard work, she works almost like 25 hours a day. And she's been, she actually helped me in the setting up of the dental training program in Zimbabwe, by not necessarily only by encouraging me to continue with the, uh, the idea, but also came in sometime to teach lectures to teach our students very early on when we didn't have enough staff members in the health the relationship of general health to um, dentistry. And lately she has been supporting my department in terms of supplying PP. Recently we received a, consign a huge consignment of uh, protective um, equipment for against um, COVID. And for that, and also the currently also involved in a research project uh, which is related to asthma, oral health in children, African children with asthma. So I think she has been a, a star and we hope to be able to emulate her hard work and be as productive as she is. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Professor. Thank you very much. And I appreciate you joining us uh, from Zimbabwe. I would like also to give uh, just maybe for a few minutes, Dr. John Bojanan, Associate Professor, Faculty of Dentistry from Queen Mary University of London. Uh, go, go ahead, Professor. Just unmute yourself. Thanks, Professor Alan. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can hear you. Go ahead. Uh, can I just say, what an inspiration. I, I was fascinated by Prof Fortune's talk, which is absolutely correct. I, I've known Professor Fortune for some years. She's taught me an awful lot. And her commitment to, to really top quality patient care is really inspiring and exemplary. Um, certainly within oral medicine, which is the speciality which we both work for, she's really been a tireless mentor and inspiration. She's led from the front. Uh, she's integrated both medicine and dentistry uh, to our patients and specialties benefit. And she remains fascinated by medicine and its many presentations. And of course that, makes her teaching so authentic and real. Uh, that enthusiasm is so important. It is truly mo motivating and highly effective. And the number of, of uh, students and, and doctors and dentists who've learned from her is just innumerable. The other important thing I'd like to say is that she really is an inspirational figure in clinical academia, within dentistry, but in with other aspects of health, healthcare. Uh, she's acted and continues to act as a much needed role model and mentor for many clinical academics, myself included. And in our speciality, it's, it's a bit of a challenge, clinical academia. So it's very, very important that she, she comes in with that. Outside oral medicine, as you've heard, she also works tirelessly and extensively with communities within the UK, but globally as well. And she mentors doctors, dentists, and scientists trying to navigate those really complex environments of the health education institution and healthcare. Um, so thank you, and, and I think this, this honour is richly deserved. So thank you, Professor Fortune. Thank you. Thank you, John. Thank you very much, Professor Thank you very much. Uh, also, when we 
circulate this among our members. A professor in Tisar Sairun, who is a former Minister of uh, Higher Education and Scientific Research. I'm not sure, maybe the inter she's from Sudan. She said she, she, she wasn't very well, but she said to me, Alam, I really would like to write something. And I said, fine, go ahead. So you can, you can read her comments on the brochure we created and we circulated. But she said she also would like to join us. So once I see her, uh, I will give her the opportunity to say a few, because remember Professor Farida invited her to the medical school. She showed her and there was still, it's just COVID and all these things, but there was a great opportunity for collaboration between Queen Mary University and the medical schools in Sudan. That's another thing. Now, if anyone, we still got like seven or eight minutes. Uh, if, they, if anyone would like, to say anything, to reflect, or to ask a, a quick question, not a, a difficult question, please raise your hand by that, uh, you know, that sign on the reaction. And I'm happy to give opportunity for a few people. I, if you would like to click on that hand, think on the reaction. And I'm trying to look for Professor Intisar. Uh, I'm just seeing one. If you, yes, uh, I, I, sorry to say, but it says Gordon Africa. So I'm not sure uh, if you can introduce yourself. Yes, please unmute and go ahead. Apologies, I don't know whom I'm talking. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Uh, uh, thank you very much uh, for, for the opportunity. Uh, we are most impressed uh, by the impressive credentials of uh, Farida, uh, Professor Farida Fortune. Uh, let me at least indicate that uh, I am calling from a hometown, uh, Kimberley, uh, in South Africa. And uh, we certainly uh, appreciate uh, the work that you are doing internationally. Uh, from my side, possibly just a, a question to the esteemed uh, professor. Uh, we very often, th oh yes, thank you for acknowledging the role that your parents and also your grandmother has played in the choice of your career. We very often find that many children that comes from broken homes, they fall through the cracks and doubly so also for our girl children. Uh, and often you would find that the next level of intervention would be our schools. And yet we find that within our schools that especially girl children are steered away uh, from mathematics and in doing so, uh, they might as well then kiss uh, their careers uh, goodbye. So amid these particular challenges, what would be your strongest recommendation as to how we at least preserve the opportunities for girl children to from a tender age, make that choice uh, for studying sciences, which we need uh, so much. I am really, really pleased uh, by a very, very insightful uh, presentation. Thank you very, very much, uh, Prof. Fortune, and we hope uh, to have you uh, in Kimberley so that you will be able to address all of our girl children and can have an opportunity to brag about your impressive credentials. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Do you mind just introduce yourself? And uh... Yes, I've indicated that it is uh, Gordon Africa, Okay. Uh, calling from Kimberley uh, in South Africa uh, with a sincere interest uh, in developing uh, okay. sciences for our, for our pupils and learners. Thank you very much. Thank you. Professor Farida? Um, uh, hello, uh, Gordon. Uh, thank you uh, for asking that question because that question is extremely important. And it, it's not only in Kimberley that it happens. It, it's uh, got several facets to it. Firstly, it's the schools, the community, who don't see girls as important to have uh, professions. Uh, secondly, at the schools, when there's anything extra, the emphasis will be on the boys. And thirdly, it's the wider community who, who see girls as serving and not being around the table. And now even here in London, as I said, I went to one of the local schools and they ran a fantastic uh, evening uh, for one of uh, uh, the charities uh, I'm working in. Uh, showed us around the school, very vocal, very clever, and when I asked her what she wanted to do is to go and work in the local equivalent of uh, a test, uh, okay, uh, bazaars, you know, 
uh, she did not aspire. She could not see further. And uh, uh, an experience I had in Kimberley was, I mean, I think it's a wonderful population because it was a local woman who was working in a local hotel. She was a cook there. And whenever I came back, we spoke about her daughter, what she'd do. She was illiterate. She made sure that her daughter sat every night by candlelight and she sat with her because it could only have one. And that's how she learned to read. Uh, but when her daughter wanted to be a doctor and when she got to finishing her uh, matriculation, she didn't actually have the subject. I, I, I mean, I had left when I was a child. I couldn't understand that. And she said, no, they, uh, the girls always have this other option. And so when they get to, they can't get into university because they don't have enough points. Uh, so I think that that is a wider community uh, problem. Uh, and I, as you say, by the time it happens, um, you know, what could you do? But we were very lucky with quite a lot of work uh, with the teachers in Kimberley, one specific uh, uh, teacher, Daria Herman, um, she managed to mentor her, to get her, help her get into a local college, and she's now a social worker. So that's really good. But that's one for probably a thousand who never, ever made it because of that. And I do think then there's a bit of work, and, you know, I'm very happy to do help um, uh, assist you in facilitating that uh, 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 piece of work. Thank you very much, Frida. I think we, uh, if there's any other person or anyone have any question, we got, we just brought one question from the social media, but I will give, if there's anyone who would like to ask a question, just raise the hand. But the question I got from the social media, Frida, in the UK, we started to see uh, several women are now leading universities. The latest one I see University of Sussex. Interestingly, in the announcement of the new vice chancellor being a woman, they said after 60 years, that's the first time there's a woman uh, leading a university, Sussex. But the, the question was about, we have seen, there's a lots of positive trend across UK universities. Women are now either vice chancellors or pro vice chancellor. So the question is very interesting. It's not why it took too long to have been, but what have been? Why suddenly we see women's leading university? I know it's a, it's, it's, it's a, it's a rather tricky question. Not why it took 60 years for women to be vice chancellors, but suddenly the trend is positive. I have also looked at the, in Denmark and other countries. I can see in Sudan, we have one uh, University of Khartoum is led by a woman. So there is a good trend showing now women are leading universities now. So if you can conclude this nice session with that answer. So what is happening? Why are we suddenly wake up to give women leadership in university or what happened? Well, I would think that's a paucity of men who is good. <laughs> <laughs> and I think, I mean, that's been the driver. Women have always been there. They've always been very good. They've been seen as a pair of hands, but not visualized as leaders. And I think the other professions like uh, law and business have pushed it to this. And, you know, the FT, uh, the FTSE has said, you know, they've got to be at least a third of women uh, uh, leading businesses. We're still not there. And you still, you think it's in the right direction. And every time that happens, it goes to that point and then it drops off. And what you will see in the universities, the women are the VPs, okay, the vice uh, uh, principals or the vice chancellors, but they they not ever in uh, that position. And when they are in a leading position, they expected to do the leadership job and all the jobs underneath because the men don't want to do it. They don't see themselves as doing it. So unless you're very, very strong, uh, you know, you the next generation that comes up, it doesn't do it. I mean, I think the other thing is we should also look at other countries because I remember 
12 years ago in Malaysia, you know, nine, 11 of their 19 faculties were run by women. So really, um, it's always been there. Uh, we always think of other countries or outside of Europe not doing these things, but actually they have. Uh, and, and as I say, uh, in Europe, when women get these leading roles, they're expected to do the leading role plus all the vice roles under it. And that's a tremendous pressure. Uh, and so um, a few stay on. Uh, but a lot of them uh, don't. But I do think we should look at other countries at the models that they have, uh, because we always think those, those people aren't equal. Look what we do. We have equality here. We have equality in Europe, but you don't have that in the Middle East. And I mean, even when I went to Egypt, they had more women being lecturers there than here. We have 10%, okay, of uh, black minority ethnic groups and even less women who get above uh, 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 into a senior lecturer position. So it's still a huge amount of work. You know, the exception, okay, but you, you will see we still have a huge amount of uh, sexism uh, in uh, uh, science and higher education in the UK. Women don't get enough grants, you know. Yeah, and I always... Uh, there's another committee I'm sitting on at the moment, and I'm saying, you know, you shouldn't show people's names because that's an unconscious bias and always uh, uh, disadvantages uh, women. So it's inherent, right? And I know the whole the UK has stopped doing unconscious bias training. It's important, right? We all have biases. We all have prejudices, right? one person another against another, one color against another, one religion against another, we're never going to get anywhere. But if you teach unconscious bias, at least people are aware, right? And, and that doesn't happen. So even in a place uh, with uh, uh, Mr. Africa in Kimberley, um, it is really important. You know, they have unconscious biases there. They don't think girls are good enough. They don't think girls are worthy. They don't think girls should, you know, uh, I remember my father's trying to get me married off and I met this chap and he said, oh, Farida, uh, you know, you've done all these things. You can come home now and be a housewife because that they all they thought that women could attain. Lots of work to do still, but well done for whoever gets there. And <laughs> you woman, well done to you. Thank you very much, Farida. Thank you very, very much. Uh, wonderful uh, conclusions there. Uh, thank you very much for all those uh, who have contributed and thank you to all those who have joined us from all over the world. So please remember, if we all help and do a little bit, it will make a big difference.